chairman and co-founder of Team Lease Services, one of India's leading staffing and human capital firms. We will be in conversation with Mr. Pranjal Sharma, former head of Bloomberg TV, economic analyst, uh, writer, and author of India Automated, member of various boards, and also a very good friend of IMA. A warm welcome to you, Manish and Pranjal, and thank you both so much for joining us today. We will discuss a okay. subject which, is, which has the entire country and, in fact, the entire world in its grip, COVID. The COVID policy window, challenges, and opportunities. While COVID has been a black swan event, has the entire world in its grip, it would be great to hear from Manish his thoughts on the challenges still facing all of us and the opportunities it brings for us. With these words, I'm pleased to hand over the reins of the session to Pranjal. Over to you, Pranjal. Thank you. Thank you, Rekha. And uh, welcome, Manish, uh, to this session. Uh, everybody else who has joined uh, for this leader speak. I think uh, the policy framework is very wide, but uh, given uh, Manish's very, very articulate thoughts on issues around employment and skilling, uh, I guess he's going to be speaking about that. Uh, there is actually two schools of thought, Rekha. You know, one, one set say that this is a black swan event, but another set say this is a white swan event to the extent that you knew that a pandemic was going to happen. Everybody had predicted it, including uh, global leaders like Bill Gates and various institutions, except nobody knew how and when it will happen. So uh, while we were, we knew that the crisis like a, you know, a landslide or an earthquake, we were just not prepared for it. But I think we are now learning very fast. Let me hand over to Manish because I don't want to second guess what he's saying. Uh, Manish, over to you. Maybe, you know, you could address us for about 20 minutes or so. And then we'll get, take in a uh, discussion from me as well as uh, all the uh, audience which has joined in. Over to you, Manish. Thank you. Thanks, Pranjal. Thanks, Rekha. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Obviously, it's an important sort of um, time for all of us, if not confusing. I prefer to use the word important because, you know, it's, 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 it's an opportunity as well as a challenge. And, and I'd say the most relevant question for policymakers, for entrepreneurs, and for individuals and investors is what, you know, Jonas Sachs, he was the founder of the polio vaccine. He used to say the most important question is, are we being good ancestors? And I have been thinking very hard about that question because how countries, how companies and how investors and individuals will balance the next quarter and the next quarter century will really decide whether we succumb to this virus or we surmount this virus in, in the sense of life afterwards. Right. I, I think there is um, there is obviously real pain. You know, GST is three lakhs short. Um, NPAs will probably be somewhere between three lakhs and five lakhs new ones, and the 25% GDP contraction is real. But you know we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Um, depending on how much debt you have, depending on how much client concentration you have, depending on which geography you operate in, I think we have to think very very differently about um, you know the future. And and so. I wanted to frame my sort of discussion as the problem, the context, and the possible solutions. I think the problem, the short term, is getting too much attention. And I'm getting a little tired of this, this shrill voice which says that we should borrow 10 lakh crores and steal from our grandchildren and throw the money from helicopters. Because I think in the short term, it's unmodelable. You know, unless we answer three questions around the virus, around um, demand, and around professions, we really don't know what to do. The virus question is, are we at the start, middle, or end of the virus? The demand is, are consumers and companies going to be frugal or are they going to be hedonistic? Which is, are they going to save for a rainy day or are they going to live for today, right? Many people believe that companies and individuals be like, you know what P.G. Woodhouse said, a cat who sat on a hot stove will not sit on a cold stove again. But um, the most important one is about professions. You know, there are so many professions in India which can't be done with social distancing at the bottom of the pyramid. China's farm to non-farm transition happened to factories. India's farm to non-farm is happening to sales, customer service and logistics. And those jobs can't be done with social distancing. So I would be careful with this magic sort of um, from fiscal and monetary policy. You know, fiscal and monetary policy in most times is not as effective as people think. And I don't think we can run a fiscal deficit like the U.S. The U.S. this year is running a $3.2 trillion fiscal deficit. That's almost equal to our GDP. 
And monetary policy can only do a few things. It can reduce interest rates, it can give liquidity to financial institutions, and it can offer regulatory forbearance. And I think um, RBI has done a good job with that. So the, the question really is, is, you know, all policy can do in the short run is to make sure that death doesn't, disease doesn't lead to death, working capital problems don't lead to bankruptcy, and unemployment doesn't lead to hunger. I think that there are unrealistic expectations in the short run. Anything you can do by Friday, which is what people always ask, you know, what are you going to do by Friday? I mean, that's usually not as effective. So I would submit that the long term one is really important where we have to think about what is the challenge for India. And I would submit that all COVID has done is exposed our pre-existing conditions. India does not have a jobs problem. We have a wages problem. Everybody who wants a job has a job. Every, our unemployment rate has stayed between 4 and 9% since independence. But obviously, we've had huge poverty. So when the problem is employed poverty, you see what we saw in that noisy unemployment data. You know, 8% unemployment went to 28% in May and then went back to 8%. And my case is that that is sort of absolutely the wrong numbers to be looking at. And because if you, the problem is, if you think our problem is unemployment, you'll throw money from helicopters, you'll mandate a three day work week, you will take away people's spoons and give them sort of, take away their tractors and give them spoons. But if you think the problem is jobs, you will think about product wages, then you will think about productivity productivity of individuals, productivity of firms, and productivity of regions. You know, I live in Karnataka, my parents live in UP. The GDP is the same, but Karnataka has one-fourth the number of people of UP, which means we're four times more productive than people in UP. If you think of firms, the World Bank just put out a report. At the top and the bottom of Indian manufacturing, there's a 22 times difference in productivity. If you think of um, individuals, you know, retail floor supervisor, one of my clients pays 8,000 and one of them pays 40,000 for a kid the same age and job description exactly the same, but obviously the skills are very different. So I would submit that this short-term problem is very real, but there's very little we can do and we should now offer long-term solutions to this problem. And I think the policy window has three windows. There's a structural window for India, there's a global window for India, and then there's a policy window. And let me sort of explain each one. So the structural window is changes to the world of work, world of organizations, and world of education. I would submit the new world of work where employment has shifted from being a lifetime contract to a taxi cab relationship. There is a new world of organizations where organizations don't live that long. You know, the four, when the first Fortune 500 list came out in 1955, the average life expectancy was 64. Now, the average life expectancy of Fortune 500 company is only 14 years. So what is the value of a pension promise from a company that only lives 14 years. And obviously the world of education has completely changed because in a world where Google knows everything, knowing is sort of useless. Learning how to learn is the key skill. And 20, that model of 25 years of learning, 25 years of earning and 25 years of retirement, that train has left the station. But we still don't recognize, or at least most people would not think that in two years, employed learners in the university system will be more than full-time learners. And employed learners obviously think very differently. So if there we have a structural window, then there is a global window. You know, I think China's wages have gone up. It's fighting a trade war. And there are lots of factory refugees looking for a new place to bring home. The most important global window is the global glut of capital. You know, $14 trillion, almost 25% of the world's bonds are trading at negative or zero interest rates. Fixed income has become no income. And that means that we misprice growth or we value growth a lot. And India is one of the few places in the world or one of the few large countries because of our past sins where we have two decades of growth still left which means global capital is going to be mispricing growth or at least chasing growth, and that really makes India attractive. And obviously, I think the U.S. Federal Reserve, they just redefined what they're going to consider inflation. They have expanded their balance sheet. They have sort of, I think they're confusing. They have lending powers. They don't have spending powers. And so we have a huge opportunity because of what's happening globally. So, all this combines to build what I call a policy window or what John Kingdon called a policy window, where the problem, solution, and opportunity come together. 
So what are the solutions? I think many of you know it, so I won't spend much time on it, but it would be compliance reform, labor reform, education reform, banking reform, urbanization reform. You know, compliance reform is the lowest hanging fruit. We put out a report, some of you may have seen it. Um, there are 67,000 compliances. There are 6,700 filings. And this changed eight times a day last year. And most tragically, 18,000 out of these 67,000 compliances prescribe jail. You know, there's one of my favorite lines in the Vishnu Sahasranam roughly translates to why did God create fear so that he could take it away, <laughs> right? I mean, what's the point of having 18,000 ways that businessmen can go to jail other than corruption? I mean, it makes no sense. Um, at least in, in, in de facto, de jure, what may have been, but de facto, that becomes a source of corruption. So I think we need to take an ax through India's compliances for employers. I think labor reforms is very important because as long as our employment contract is marriage without divorce, factory refugees from China will look at how the law is written not how is it interpreted, practiced, and enforced. See, most of us in India have got used to the transmission losses between how the law is written, interpreted, practiced, and enforced. But an offshore investor will look at how the law is written. They don't know how it's interpreted, practiced, and enforced. And so unless we change the 45% salary confiscation, you know, Provident Fund, ESI, EDLI, EPS, wages. So whenever I give somebody at the bottom of the pyramid a 25,000 rupee appointment letter, he says, haath wali salary or chitthi wali salary, right? Mujhe haath wali salary bolo na, I mean, chitthi wali se mujhe kya hai? So I think that labor reform, obviously chapter 5B of the Industrial Disputes Act is important, but labor reform um, sort of thinking about multiple wages, thinking about 45% salary confiscation. And I don't think labor reform means no labor laws. You know, I think what UP has done will be counterproductive. I think, you know, there's a wonderful new biography of Dada Bhai Naroji by Dinyar Patel, where he described Dada Bhai Naroji as he was too moderate for the radicals and he was too radical for the moderates. And I would submit that's the only way we will get labor reform. If we define labor reform as no labor laws, we will get zero labor reform. We need to think about labor reform as a series of steps that balances the contract between employer and employee, which currently is sort of unfair. I think education reform, the new education policy is a wonderful document. I would submit that for the first time, you know, I have always thought in public policy that the messenger matters more than the message. But, you know, Gandhiji articulated a wonderful vision of vocational training and experiential learning in 1938 at an education conference in Varda. He called it Nai Talim. But, you know, vocational training did not make it to the 1948 Radha Krishnan report on education. It didn't make it to the Kothari Committee report in 1968. And it didn't make it to the new education policy in 1986. But finally, NEP has a big role for vocational training. I think many divergent systems need to exist. I think banking reform is really, really important because India's credit to GDP ratio is only 50%. I don't think China's 300% credit to GDP ratio is the right number, but I think India has to get to 100% credit to GDP ratio. We only had 97 banks in um, 1947. We have 94 banks today. We need many more banks. We need better governance. We need a higher game in regulation and supervision, and we need to get rid of the distinction between banks and non-banks. I would submit the, the meta reform here would obviously be urbanization, which is the most complicated, right? Because 29 chief ministers matter more than one prime minister for job creation and education and healthcare. But 100 mayors matter more than 29 chief ministers, but we don't really have real mayors. And I think the GST sort of struggle right now between the state and the center, the two extremes are wrong positions. And it's an old debate. You know, Indira Gandhi in 10 of her speeches had said strong states lead to a weak nation. And N.T. Ramarao had once said, the central government is a conceptual myth. India is run by its chief ministers. So I'd say life is sort of somewhere in between those two. But I, I, I think that we have to really, you know, calmness is power in a crisis. And, you know, pain is not the disease. Pain is the symptom of the disease. If, we, if you think back to U.S.'s opioid crisis, it really took off the prescriptions of painkillers when doctors and medical practitioners were convinced that pain is the fifth vital sign. You know, pain is not the fifth vital sign. And now medical profession recognizes that overprescribing painkillers may is really harmful for patients. And I would submit that um, the current crisis is really big, but you know, we can't take our fiscal deficit to 15 or 19% of our GDP. 
I think beyond the point tweaking monetary policy or financial regulation, you can't choose borrowers over lenders all the time. You know, financial stability. We have one lakh forty thousand crore in deposits. We have one hundred lakh crores in loans or credit out there. The noise always is about regulatory forbearance, but there's a fine balance in a system between borrowers and lenders, and let's be mindful of that as we take our decisions going forward. But obviously, I think that when we compare ourselves to China, you know, our we are very different from China. The regulatory sort of Let's just say that economic complexity is what we have. Ricardo Hosman, he's one of my favorite professors at the Kennedy School, and he always says the only sustained predictor of economic success is economic complexity. And India is very economically complex. We do everything and we make everything, but we don't always do it well and we don't always do it at scale. And the question which we will ask in this policy window ourselves, which we should ask, is we have to shift from what should be done to how it should be done. And I think this is the mistake that we have made, because there is a 20-year-old report. You know, you could change the date on the Rustamji report in 1979 and not go wrong with police reforms. The Apprenticeship Act was the 20th point in Indira Gandhi's 20-point program. So my submission is that civil service reform may be the most important meta reform. We don't need 250 people in Delhi with the rank of Secretary to Government of India. We don't need 52 ministries in Delhi. Japan only has eight cabinet ministers. U.S. only has 14 and U.K. only has 22. Why do we need 55 um, of them in Delhi? I think it would sort of it would take time to sort of replicate this this ambition that we have demonstrated in politics. Right. We have had a lot of political ambition, Article 370, Swachh Bharat, you know, demon, demonetization, many things. We need to replicate that now in sort of radical reform here. But I think it's it's eminently possible now because of the pain that COVID is causing. I, it would be horrible for me to say that COVID is something I've been waiting for. But India doesn't change for a better option. She changes when you have no option. And um, many of the conversations on the table right now around banking or labor or compliance reform or education reform were not on the table for the last you know, two years, even though we knew that they were required. So my submission would be that, um, you know, we most people who talk about India, I can make out their sophistication on whether they're ranting about what needs to be done or how it is to be done, because what needs to be done there's a report 20 years old. But how is the nazakat, you know, the difference between a list of ingredients and the recipe? Right. Everybody knows the list of ingredients, but the recipe is really where the magic lies in proportioning and sequencing. And as you know, John Kingdon said, when there is pain, the problem, solution and opportunity come together. So at least in my view, I don't think COVID is climate change. I think it is a passing shower. But we must use this to sort of create climate change for entrepreneurs in India. I mean, India has been a hostile habitat for entrepreneurship for decades. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we need to we need to recognize that we will not have a few people creating millions of jobs. We will have millions of people creating a few jobs. Um, our 63 million enterprises only translate to 22,500 companies with a paid up capital of more than 10 crores. That is not some cultural aversion to capital in India. It is just the regulatory cholesterol, the lack of infrastructure has been holding us back, right? As an entrepreneur, there are two kinds of companies you can create, a baby and a dwarf. A baby and a dwarf are both small, but the baby is going to grow and the dwarf is going to stay there. Unfortunately, most enterprises in India have been dwarfs, right? So our labor is handicapped without capital and our capital is handicapped without labor. And so it's important to recognize why we can hold the mirror up to ourselves and ask ourselves this question that um, why is 63 million enterprises have no capital and why do 22,500 companies have lots of capital and no labor? But I think I'm, I'm quite, um, it's a difficult time for the planet. It's a difficult time for, for humans. But I think that um, this is really an opportunity for India because China's brand has been damaged. I think um, Japan obviously is and you know, they'll go to 125 million people to 75 million within our lifetime because of demographics. Europe, they're 8 percent of the world's population, 25 percent of the world's GDP, but have 50 percent of the world's social security payments. So Europe is painted itself into a bit of a fiscal corner. So I think India is really has an opportunity here, and I hope that we will be able to take advantage of it.
So I'll stop here and um, Pranjal, should we have a chat or questions, whatever you'd like. Right, thanks. Uh, that's quite a you know, wide spectrum, uh, Manish. You've, you've uh, spoken across all that uh, pretty smoothly. Um, uh, you know, Manish, you talked about COVID as a passing shard. Uh, let me draw another analogy that is it like an acid rain because a passing shard perhaps nourishes, but an acid rain leaves scars and uh, permanent changes. Um, I think that it's too early to talk about what labor market his economists call hysteresis. See, hysteresis is when people in the labor market lose connection with employers, they lose connection with skills. See, the challenge in comparing ourselves to Western economies is that what are labor market, two labor market shock absorbers in India, farm employment and self-employment. See, self-employment in India is self-exploitation. Not really self-employment, right? There was this idiot Russian economist in the 1920s who convinced Nehru that small farms are viable, China, because you don't have to pay yourself a salary, your kids a salary, and you don't have to price your own um, resources. So I would say that um, the 45% um, of our labor force in farms, which only produces 15% of our GDP, is a shock absorber. And I know I was fascinated by lots of people saying, oh, these migrants have gone home and therefore we're having rural prosperity. I, that, that's just not understanding. These the migrants were not running towards cities. They were running away from villages. So I would submit that in the short run, actually, the challenges with India, why is India poor? Because of the productivity of our sectors, of our, of our people, of our cities and of sort of sectors. Is a, is a, that bug is a feature in a crisis like this. We have a shock absorber, um, people self-exploit. So I'm not sure we will suffer the kind of hysteresis that say advanced economies could suffer because we're so far from the productivity frontier. You know, a, a, an economy with $50,000 per capita will some, suffer hysteresis, but an economy with a per capita income of $2,500 will obviously have um, adjustments that may not always be good from a pure productivity perspective, but do exist. So um, I'm not sure that it's, a, it, it, if it continues for six months or one month more, as I started off saying that we don't know whether we're in the middle end or the start of the virus, if it continues for longer, I think we could. But we the 25% GDP crash in the first quarter is already much lower in the second quarter and will be much, much lower. At least, you know, FMCG is back to 100% capacity. Many of our customers out of our 3,000 customers are back to 100% capacity. Um, the first quarter, I don't know why people are surprised by a 25% GDP crash. I mean, companies are rivers. We are not ponds. Shareholders don't pay salaries. Customers do. If customers were forced so, on strike, you know, money, money to, that's to just, how it will uh, be. Yeah, so that's that's great. But I want to come back to this very important insight that we would seek from you. Uh, what of these changes that we see around us are going to be permanent? Perhaps you could pick up the uh, you know the point on uh, labor and the way we work. And I've I've uh, uh, heard what you've said that you know the whole piece on work from home is only for ten percent, and it's not for the uh, you know yeah. bulk of 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 the working population in the country, but. COVID has accelerated a lot of things, right? The adoption of technology, uh, digital and financial inclusion to a large number of people for better or for worse, whether in crisis or not. What are the changes you think we'll come back to and what are the changes you think we'll live with, uh, again, for better or for worse? I don't think COVID has created any new trends. Any crisis like this accelerates existing ones. We have had been having the deconstruction of organizations for decades. Um, employment shifting from a lifetime contract to a taxi cab relationship has been happening for decades. COVID will accelerate that. I think digital payments, we had set ourselves a target of a billion a month. We accomplished that. Now our next target is a billion a day for UPI. And that has been brought forward by five years. <laughs> I think in going from a gross enrollment ratio of 28% to 50% was anyway going to depend on technology and ed tech. I think that digital learning has been brought from 2030 to 2020 in eight or nine months. 
So I think it's very hard to predict the future. You know, I've studied 50 of the reports which try to predict where jobs will be in the next 20 years or 30 years or 50 years for various countries. And most of them have the efficacy of palm reading or astrology, right? 50% of the jobs created in the U.S. in every decade since 1960 didn't exist in the decade before that. But we can make ourselves worthy of the future. So instead of trying to predict where jobs are, we can make our job creation habitat more fertile and more self-healing, less regulatory cholesterol, more financialization, more urbanization. These are horizontal interventions, right? We don't want to pick big, big companies or small companies. We don't want to pick small entrepreneurs or big entrepreneurs. So my submission would be is that um, it's hard to model. I don't think work from, I don't think this is the end of offices or the end of organizations or the end of sort of cities, as many people surmise. I think we will have more flexibility, right? Uh, that's, that is clear. Before COVID, first of all, 90% can't work from home. Among the cognitive elite who can work from home, between five and 10 worked from home or had some flexibility. I think about 20 to 35% after COVID, we'll have the flexibility. And obviously, IT will be a, a really important um, space where they have discovered. So IT total employment will go from 4 million to 8 million, and that will probably have... Um, but IT is only 4 million out of our 550 million labor force, right? So I, so right. I wouldn't hesitate. I would hesitate to... Um, it's still the data is too noisy to judge what is permanent and what is not. That's a good point. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take one more question. I'll, I'll put one more question to you. And then we have some questions coming in from the audience and they're placing it on the chat window. Um, it seems to me that what you're saying is that almost everything is accelerating. Uh, yes. The flies are accelerating uh, and they're more visible. Uh, and I think the lack of preparedness is also visible. But what you seem to be saying is that what we really need to accelerate is reforms. And that doesn't seem to be accelerating. I mean, I, I think that uh, if we don't do reforms now, I don't know when we will do reform, right? <laughs> so my sense is we are out of room in fiscal policy. The fight with GST is not somebody being stingy. There is genuinely no resources. <laughs> I mean, there's just, there's just no money left. I think with fiscal policy, we have to ask ourselves, what can we do more? I mean, we can't choose lenders over borrowers all the time or borrowers over lenders. We need to really strike a, a balance between borrowers and lenders. So I think that there, uh, if you think of agricultural reform, the end of APMC, the end of the essential commodities, we have had sort of Purna Swaraj for agriculture if it gets executed. I'm quite impressed with the new education policy. It represents a cumulative sort of thing. I wish they, instead of 15 year Purna Swaraj for universities, they should give it in five years. But I think at least we have a glide path to um, freedom for universities. So I think the important ones left are compliance reform, labor reform, um, obviously banking reform and a few others. And my sense is they will come. Um, there are huge efforts going on. If they don't come now, I don't know when they will come. So I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, hope is not a strategy, but I think, um, you know, our choices would sort of have to reflect our hopes rather than our fears, right? Correct. I think that's the that's the one thing we have to hold on to, hope and, uh, and confidence in the fact that we can uh, stride through this uh, situation. A couple, few questions coming in. Uh, Manisha, I'm going to just uh, toss them to you. Uh, one question from Mr. Khatri uh, is uh, with reference to what uh, uh, Raghuram Rajan, the former governor of RBI, said about, uh, you know, that the government of India seems to have gone into a shell and is, is you know, shell-shocked or is like uh, deer facing headlights uh, right now. Would you, would you agree with that? Well, I just say that, you know, we recommend in poetry, but we govern in prose, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, all of us who are, uh, uh, I, I sometimes am a little bit because I'm on the RBI board. I would submit that governance is about making choices. And I think that when Raghuram Rajan was the governor of the RBI, I don't think this would have been his advice. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> so, you know, I think that it's easier to give advice when you're not responsible for implementing it. And, and all of us must be mindful for that. But I don't think this would be the advice he would be giving if he was the governor of the RBI. So and while, I think you say, that, while you say, uh, uh, Manish, that, you know, you don't want to predict, and I think that's very sensible because we should not, uh, you know, uh, 
lull ourselves into some kind of complacency with the prediction which will not be you know which is on a, a really a moving target um, but the question that uh, few people have uh, including uh, uh, shubha pratha sharma is really about this all of gdp um, is there now all kinds of alphabet are being tossed around for the recovery from you know v to w to k and i don't know whether there's going to be uh, more alphabet coming into the picture but uh is there anything that we can look out for as far as recovery is concerned i think it would be irresponsible for me to make it our recovery is linked to knowing when whether we are at the start middle or end of the virus and i think that is just only i mean it's it's hard to deal with but i think that till the virus is till we have a vaccine till we have a plan to vaccinate everybody i think even if the government didn't impose a lockdown voluntarily people are you know this virus this virus is so poorly understood and so highly infectious and so synchronized globally that i think we just have to make sometimes you know there we just don't know the answer to that so that doesn't mean we should not take fiscal and monetary policy action i think the best response would be to do a lot of structural reforms so that we give you know change is a form of hope also i think change is an important form of hope in any organization in any country so if we signal to our own selves to our own self talk is important right and if we're willing to change i think that would be the best form of hope i would be careful i know it it's possible you know we can borrow 5 lakh crores in today's world of low fixed income costs and throw money from helicopters but i don't think that would be the right thing to do obviously i have always been a fiscal conservative because i think the biggest gift a government can give entrepreneurs is macroeconomic stability with low inflation people sort of underestimate how inflation is a, a huge infl- tax on the poor but it also makes decision making very difficult so i think macroeconomic stability for a country like india is really really important and we have won our inflation battle with a uh, very difficult with great difficulty and i think it may be something worth preserving something like the agri fund there's a question from from one of the audience members uh, that the Uh, agriculture fund seems to be a good idea uh, to to look at is this something that you would say is a positive step uh, of, you know we you did refer to the rural demand and the agri sector and the rural demand are linked in some ways i i think the only way to help farmers is to have less of them right let's just be clear about that you know there was arthur lewis got his nobel prize for his work on on agriculture and one of the countries he did the study was india he has a wonderful article in epw in the 1950s and i think at this stage 20 years after reforms began 75 years after independence having 45% of our labor force work in agriculture just condemns them to poverty so i would submit that the faster we can get them out of uh, 45 million which is almost half 45% which is almost half a labor force out of farms so yes we need to improve the productivity of farms and one of the challenges for farm productivity has been the access to credit i mean farm credit has been between 8 and 9% of total credit for decades now and despite many committees sort of doing that like msme has been stuck at 20% of total credit so i think yes the agri fund is a great idea getting rid of apmcs is a good idea getting rid of the essential commodities act is a great idea you know the purna swaraj for farmers which was long overdue is is hopefully arriving soon and the net effect of that will be is that if you're a farmer you don't necessarily need to be poor you know this uh, point on every uh, the entire onus of recovery being on the federal national government central government is something that i find a bit puzzling because india cannot grow at 8 or 9 or whatever percent if the states uh, are uh, growing at half that percentage so what about the responsibility of state governments while we did refer to the macro structural reforms i think there's a lot of uh, pain at the state level i'm not even talking about their their crisis on gst or their tussle with the central government but the fact is that we don't have a terrific history of reforms at the state level i don't see any states doing anything to improve their earnings for instance on utilities uh, you know it's still a free for all a uh, kind of uh, uh, tone 
dominates uh, political discourse at, at regional levels. If the states don't reform, how can the country reform, uh, Manish? I mean, uh, you know, for the last year, the central budget was 30 lakh crores and state budgets were 34 lakh crores. So now state budgets are more than central government, clearly. And of the 30 lakh crores in central government, almost 80 percent were confiscated to interest and salaries, while state governments, it was only 55 percent. So absolutely, states have a very important role. And of the 67,000 compliances and regulatory cholesterol that I mentioned, 65 percent of it is states. So, you know, while we have equated ease of doing business with Delhi, ease of doing business is really important at state capitals, right? So I, I, I guess the challenge for us is that five states or six states in South and West India account for almost 45% of GDP and GDP growth. And um, we have these, um, I don't know whether they're economic wastelands, but clearly economic laggards in the East and North, which traditionally have not carried their weight, but have a lot of our people. So I would say, yes, unless chief ministers, 29 chief ministers matter more than one prime minister and 100 mayors matter more than one um, chief minister. We don't have mayors, right? But no, we need empowered mayors, not just mayors, but empowered mayors. Yeah, well, Jawaharlal Nehru was, in 1924, Jawaharlal Nehru was the mayor of Allahabad, Vallabhbhai Patel was the mayor of Ahmedabad, Chitranjan Das was the mayor of, Pat of Calcutta, and Rajendra Prasad was the mayor of Patna. And I have three letters of Jawaharlal Nehru talking about street lights. I have four letters of Vallabhbhai Patel talking about school teacher absenteeism. You know, that's where the rubber meets the road. So absolutely, the GDP of New York is equal to Russia for a reason, because cities are engines of prosperity, they see they are equal to, um, that is where, so I'd say yes, we need empowered mayors today. Unfortunately, our cities are policy orphans, right? Because our elect, our, the people who have power in cities are unelected and the people who are elected cooperators have no power. You know, IAS officers run the municipal corporations, they should not be running it. So I would submit that it's very important for us to decentralize the 73rd and 74th Amendments, um, which worked for Panchayat Raj, did not work for cities. But chief ministers today are the biggest barrier to decentralizing resources and power to cities because, um, you know, cities are, are their source of power. Um, and so I would submit that while we have decentralized funds, functions, and functionaries from Delhi to state capitals in the last five, 10 years. We have not decentralized from state capitals to, to the cities. And um, yes, you're, you're absolutely right that um, ho hopefully this crisis will remind people that everything in education and everything in healthcare and everything in infrastructure in their daily lives is not controlled by Delhi, it is controlled by the chief minister. Manish, a couple of questions on, on uh, you know, working uh, conditions. Uh, one very interesting question uh, is uh, by Arun Kumar Agarwal saying that, you know, you, you refer to apprenticeship and we have the concept of minimum wage, but I think it's time for us to perhaps have a different minimum wages for different levels of people or with different skill sets. That's a question he has. So should there be uh, differential minimum wages and not just looking at the absolute bottom of the pyramid, blue collar, uh, you know, muscle-oriented worker? I think so. I think there is a case for most sophisticated wage setting at the bottom. It, actually, we need something like the Monetary Policy Committee, which we set up for interest rates for minimum wages, right? It needs to be a technocratic process. It needs to be, we don't need a national minimum wage. It's a really, really bad idea. And I think that finally, I hopefully it is being held back. But uh, at one point, there was a proposal for a national minimum wage, which will no longer be um, there. So yes, I think based on skill set, based on location, cost of living adjustment is quite substantially different. And, um, you know, the basic difference at the bottom of the pyramid or even higher is just the difference between real wages and nominal wages. Right. I had a kid in Gwalior a few years ago say, give me 4,000 rupees in Gwalior, 7,000 rupees in Gurgaon, 11,000 rupees in Delhi and 18,000 rupees in Bombay. My bag is back. Tell me where you want me to go. I said, why do you need 18,000 in Bombay? He said, jitne bachche Bombay 10,000 mein gaye te, sab wapas aage. Khana rehna, office jana nahi banta hai 10,000 mein. Mainne bula, but tum to second class fail hai. Why will somebody give you 18,000? He says, aray sir, mein graduate se khana kam thodi khata hoon. <laughs> right, so it was a very sophisticated argument of reimbursement of, it was, he was asking for a cost of living adjustment. He wasn't asking for wages, right? 
And I think this difference between nominal wages and real wages in big cities is because our real estate markets and our public transport systems have not developed. Actually, this, so, so I think setting minimum wages reflects our urbanization deficit, it reflects our public transport deficit, and it reflects our land market, which is really inefficient. So I would be careful with the national minimum wage, and I completely agree that um, we need a much more sophisticated framework for setting minimum wages. You know, the other issue is about entrepreneurship. Uh, there are two levels to this. Uh, let me let me first uh, talk about something which, you know, bothers me a lot. I, I've always felt that Indian entrepreneurs, by and large, again, not a sweeping statement, uh, are very risk averse. They are not risk taking. They have grown up in an environment of uh, access based entrepreneurship and not uh, merit based entrepreneurship. And I think uh, while we talk about the problems at the policy level, the fact is that even the exhortation by, by a personality like the prime minister uh, sometimes does not get traction on ground because our entrepreneurs in many ways are not able to live up to the, to the opportunities that a challenge throws up. Is there a need for a change uh, in the thinking of our business leaders as well? I don't think that there are cultural explanations for India's poverty or entrepreneurship, right? Because I think cultural explanations are at best the soft bigotry of low expectations or... So contextual, uh, Manish, I, I'm not saying cultural, they're contextual because they've grown up in an environment where you could, if you had a license, and even in the last 25 years, access was more important than uh, access to policymakers was more important than access to markets. But that depends. If you, in the broad sweep of history, between 1820 and 1950, India grew at 0.1%. Between 1950 and 1991, we grew at 2.5%. And from 1991, so there was an economist called Krishna Raj who called it the Hindu rate of growth, right? But from 1991 till now, we've grown at 7% and we didn't shoot all the Hindus, right? So clearly that was an incomplete explanation of why India was growing at 0.1 or 2%. So I would submit that... Um, the kind of entrepreneurship you saw was the kind of entrepreneurship you legislated for, right? If, if, if you don't have customers and you have hostages in the license Raj, <laughs> then um, those companies will not survive. You know, animals bred in captivity find it hard to live in the jungle. See, I live in Bangalore. And for me, the kind of role models, the kind of companies, the kind of funding around me are completely different from what I, when I used to live in Delhi or, or in Hyderabad. And, and so I would submit that um, I think that uh, if we, entrepreneurs cannot substitute for the state. You know, people already asked us to generate our own power. We already provide our own transport. We are, you know, we can't manufacture our own employees. You know, skill systems don't work. So I think that the bar for being an entrepreneur also has been really high to do it at scale. So I think that I don't think that there's a cultural challenge. I think that if we give Purna Swaraj to our entrepreneurs in, in, in various ways, compliance, labor laws, uh, urbanization, they will respond quite ferociously and quite um, well. So new entrepreneurs now, Manish, is COVID and the crisis, whether you know it's a beginning or the middle or the end, we don't know. Is a situation like this an opportunity or a challenge? How should how should entrepreneurs, especially the younger ones, and when I say young, I don't mean by age of the uh, founder, but the age of the company. A um, lot of uh, senior professionals are also launching uh, their own uh, ventures. So the point is that is this a time for for companies to think about or for people to think about entrepreneurship in a new way? Do you think it's easier to launch in in a situation like this or? Um, it is just, you know, a wasting effort and you wait for a better time. I mean, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. I'll use the same expression because I, I think that is really appropriate for thinking about entrepreneurship. I mean, you have to survive in order to succeed, right? I think that's always the fundamental of entre entrepreneurship is the art of staying alive long enough to get lucky. 
if you get lucky if you stay alive long enough at some point you'll get lucky is what i have learned i don't know whether that's the way everybody views it that way but i think that yes i think that um for some people at least the way i'm thinking about it you know i went public i'm a listed company i went public 2 3 years ago and for me this opportunity of formalizing india of small weak competitors not being able to hack it is a unique opportunity now um what does that mean for india as a whole do i mean we don't need 63 million enterprises the us economy is eight times our size it only has 22 million enterprises <laughs> so so i mean you don't need, number of enterprises is not necessarily what india needs we need more babies rather than dwarfs right because dwarfs tend to they're small but they stay small and babies are small but they grow right so we need more babies so so if you think about entrepreneurship not as self exploitation if you think of entrepreneurship as high potential ventures then i think covid really makes the strong stronger it makes strong hinder stronger that is that is clearly what happens right even with relationships or i mean today all of us online are making more withdrawals from our social capital than deposits right but imagine management trainees graduating this year how will they build relationships how will they learn things you know everybody learns by sitting in the back of a room so i think covid is a unique opportunity for incumbents um but also it becomes a nice opportunity for insurgents um to 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 depending on your uh, on your social capital your financial capital and your obviously of your 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 sort of cultural capital as a, as a, as a as a firm i know some firms which are freezing up saying that you know batten down hatches cut all costs there's no point in thinking about the future right now but my i i would say that you know this is the point when you will can make the bets which will last you not about the next quarter but the next quarter century <laughs> right this is the time when you know for i am quite convinced that the next 25 years in india will be very different from the last 25 years because your reform has accumulated but there are clear examples when you uh, you know you talked about insurgents and incumbents um and to strive but i can i can uh, uh, you know list at least six categories of uh, opportunities which have opened up uh, in the last uh, few months alone Uh, not just to you know for example space tech is is something which the government has talked about nb is created so much more options for uh, edupreneurs uh, but if you also look at the geopolitic uh, impact of or geoeconomic impact of uh, our relationship with china right now the obvious examples on digital uh, platforms but also value chain manufacturing uh, the toy industry for example uh, there are several sectors apis for pharmaceuticals Uh, the fact that india could pick, you know build a 2 billion dollar tt industry in a matter of weeks i think is something which hasn't got enough attention in in my view so there are very clear options of growth which have emerged which didn't exist perhaps in in january in the scale that we could have anticipated and in the time frame that we see right now so isn't there much to hope and be optimistic about there if the entrepreneurs take the risk and the challenge and bet long i i think so but um i wouldn't feel so if i was running a hotel or an airline <laughs> i wouldn't no, feel so sectors, if i was for example <laughs> so what is the airline area crisis but i'm talking about what is opened up uh, which didn't exist earlier yeah so i don't know how to make the calculation on whether this is a net plus or a net minus right <laughs> there are large swaths of the economy which are suffering and there are large swaths of the economy which are opening up i i just think you know the only way to be absolutely certain about something is to know everything or nothing about it <laughs> you know so i would submit that we can't be certain about whether in the short run this is a positive but if you study crises through history of course they are the places when entrepreneurs make bets and come out ahead so i i believe that for 80% of india's education and labor market infrastructure you know education employment and employability is where i operate 80% of india's 2040 infrastructure is yet to be built and covid accelerates that so clearly for me it's an opportunity but i have lots of friends who you know who work in airlines or who work in hotels you know who work in construction and who work in areas which uh, are i mean there is there, there is no light at the end of the tunnel yet for them so i would just say that covid is a macroeconomic and civilizational cataclysm 
but with all cataclysms it can create opportunities and pain for different people so we're all in the same storm but we're not in the same boat a good point uh, manish but again i'm not referring to the net impact of the economy because obviously as you said we don't have enough information to make that call i'm merely referring to the fact that the opportunities which are arising today uh, which are not covid related because uh, what's happened with china is nothing to do with covid perhaps a little bit but not too much the fact is that if a new opportunity arises in a time of larger crisis would you recommend or do you think entrepreneurs in india would have the guts and the gumption to jump for it it depends i mean i can i can raise money today but i know many people can't um so i i'm just careful with sort of prescribing to people that i know i know credit is much growing at a much slower rate than it was prior to january i know venture capital is being doled out at a much slower rate than it was before march i know private equity is at a much slower rate see i'm a first generation entrepreneur i had no money of my own i had to raise money from other people and i think it's a difficult time but if you can convince people i would say absolutely i mean i i i i'm hesitant to get, say that it's all good or all bad i i, I would say that yes if you, like an incumbent like me i count myself as an incumbent now because i went public um i have zero debt i raised money i think it's a great opportunity to buy companies which um thought that shareholders pay salaries not customers you know i have always known that customers pay salaries so i was not hormonally imbalanced to believe that you know you just raise money from investors and lose money forever so i think that um for people for people who in the past have been fiscally prudent it works see our banking system in india had 8 lakh crores of nps before covid i mean we brought it down from 14 lakh crores to 8 lakh crores but it was very weak already so i think that for a banking system covid is real a real problematic same thing is true for many companies so i think yes if you if you have um the firepower today you will get opportunities that were not available prior to march so in the sense uh, that you know from here on the the questions around uh, banking reforms and uh, all the structural reforms that you refer to uh, are critical um and i know that it's very difficult to predict uh, what what's going to happen but would you say that uh, the way india has moved or at least the policy makers have moved in taking uh, some fundamental changes and steps in various sectors uh, if you look at as you mentioned uh, apmc reform there are some uh, changes in uh, fdi reforms that at least a new reset is being placed which can help india uh, grow better in a post covid world i'm not referring to when it would be post covid but perhaps in a in a next uh, a decadal kind of growth shift i think so but i think it's not enough yet we need a more bold and an adventurous state we need more risk taking you know we have reached the limits of our current model it's not about more cooks in the kitchen it's about a different recipe right just throwing money or more cooks in the kitchen will not help india to go back to our destiny of 7 to 8% growth for 20 years um that needs taking an axe through regulatory cholesterol that needs taking an axe to a, a banking system which only has 50% credit to gdp ratio that needs taking an axe through the um ayatollahs of education like ugc and aict that needs that, so i think that uh, i don't think any you know high growth rates are not inherited they are earned and i think we have made the down payment but i do think we need more bigger bolder faster reform so that you know 1.3 billion indians can get on with it see if there's something that covid reminds us it's that per capita gdp matters more than total gdp we are fifth in total gdp which is big but we are 138th in per capita gdp and so we really have to think about per capita gdp going to you know a much higher numbers china and india had the same per capita income in 1995 and today they are four times more than us korea and india had the same per capita gdp in 1960 today they are 20 times more than us so i think that all we have to do is be honest with ourselves that um we made a wonderful political experiment in 1947 democracy which paid off but we made a stupid ex- economic experiment in 1955 and 1956 which did not pay off and now we have to change it that's all and we've been changing it since 
slowly, surely, incrementally. But COVID may be the time for a big leap. I think on that note, we should end. Thank you so much, Manish. Uh, I think it is time for a big leap. There is, of course, a wide, uh, uh, you know, canyon, if you, if I may, uh, that we have to leap over. But we also have to leap over all the mistakes of the past and then uh, start afresh in many ways. And to some extent, a foundation has been set. But if uh, negative uh, fault lines have been accelerated, I think positive reforms need to be accelerated as well. So uh, thanks very much for sharing your thoughts today. And uh, for all of you for joining, there are a you know, huge number of questions that I saw. I've tried to take as many as, as we could. But thanks again for joining. And now I'll uh, hand it back over to Rekha. Thanks, Pranjal, and thanks for being a wonderful moderator as usual. And thanks, Manish. I'd just like to read out one of the comments to you because it really struck me. It's from Mr. Jagdish Khatri. It says, compliments to learned speaker Manish Sabarwalji for a very interesting and informative talk. It was like poetry told in prose. So I think <laughs> it, you, you can't get a better compliment than that. We had uh, over 200 people logged in today online plus we had over 500 on our youtube and facebook accounts so i think it was a great session the the chat comments say it all and it only leaves for me to say thank you very much for joining us and making this session a really great success thanks pranjal for always uh, being there for ima thank you very much thank you all and i hope we'll see all of you at the national management convention which is scheduled on 21st, 22nd September. And as you know, that's IMA's flagship event and we'd love to have all of you there. So with these words, thanks. Thank you again, Manish and Pranjal and good